Patrick, tell us a little about yourself and what Thinktopia does. Uh, Thinktopia is an idea engineering company. We work uh, globally all over the, I guess this is redundant, but globally all over the world. Um, <laughs> uh, with uh, clients launching and re-engineering brands. So we've been to Guangzhou, Shanghai, Moscow, Paris, Bogota, Australia, and other places helping people uh, both package goods companies and consumer services companies and others uh, kind of reboot their brand. I see. And you also wrote the book Primal Branding, which has become one of the best sellers. Now, tell us the inspiration behind that book and some of the key ideas that you've shared in the book. Sure. Primal Branding really looks at black brands as belief systems. While there are there's certainly no uh, shortage of books on branding out there, but the reason that Primal Branding is different is because it does look at brands as belief systems. And unlike some other books that talk about, oh, Nike tribes or Apple cults mm -hmm. and forth, and isn't it fascinating how um, uh, Harley Davidson, for example, is able to, you know, lure people to Sturgis, South Dakota every year? Isn't it curious and wonderful how Apple has this diehard uh, group of people? Uh, who we now refer to who, as the Apple cult, um, is it wondrous and everything else, but they don't really tell you how you can do this for yourself other than imitating those companies, Nike, Apple, Starbucks, Coca-Cola, and so forth. So the reason that um, on the idea, where the idea for Primal Brandy really originated is that, is that I was in advertising and I was trying to solve a client problem, and I realized that advertising alone wasn't going to do this, and as a matter of fact, throughout my career in advertising, where I worked on IBM, Absolute Vodka, Pepsi, and a lot of other brands, um, all unilaterally, you know, I think I was asked to either create the next Apple campaign or the next Nike campaign. And even if you had created a great campaign that uh, won a lot of awards and got a lot of sales for the client, even if you did a top 10 Super Bowl spot, for example, if you kind of realized in your heart of hearts that you hadn't really created the next Nike or the next Apple until there was clearly something else going on. Furthermore, advertising uh, does not explain, you know, the rise of companies like Google or Starbucks or other people, other brands right. that people have a lot of affinity for and emotion for and are very successful that do not advertise at all. Mm -hmm. So clearly there was something else going on. And I wanted to figure out what it was. And so the thing that I figured out is that uh, really the brands that we have heart for and that build vibrant, resonant communities around them are the ones that have a belief system wrapped around them. And so in the book, as you know, I identify the seven things that go into the creation of a belief system. Right. So what we do when we, go out, when we work with clients is we go out and we look at those brands, we deconstruct them, for the seven pieces of what we call primal code, uh, which is a creation story, creed, icons, rituals, a special lexicon, people who don't want to be a part of your uh, community, they want to be along to someone else, they want to be, instead of being Mac, they want to be PC, instead of being Coke, they want to be Pepsi, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, the final uh, piece of code is the leader. And so we deconstruct those brands and see what pieces they have and see what pieces are missing. Mm -hmm. And by the way, these seven pieces of code are the things that companies like Nike, Apple, Starbucks, Coca-Cola, and others have been able to create themselves, uh, both through great gut instinct, by hiring smart people, by being well-financed so they can have the privilege of time to really um, work through this and uh, put these seven pieces in. And sometimes people don't have all of them, but... Uh, if you have some of them, especially in a category where, people, where your competitors have very few of these pieces, you can really differentiate yourself because each of these seven pieces is a point of differentiation. Right, so. right. Now, one of the concepts that you've mentioned in your book is creating z -lips. Now, how do you think airlines can create z for themselves? Well, this kind of gets us into uh, another article that I wrote for Advertising Age that we talked about before. Right. And, you know, there are, you know, in today's economy, 
even forgetting today's economy, last week's economy, um, <laughs> airlines weren't doing very well, and right. they continue to not, not do so well. And they've cut back on their routes, and they've cut back on services, and as anyone who's flown in the last several months realizes that if we're now being charged for luggage, uh, there are no pillows anymore or blankets, and if you're lucky enough to, have an, to be on an airline where we'll sell you one, uh, you're that much farther ahead. Right. Uh, there are no, no meals anymore and so forth. And so uh, I, I wrote an article that was published in Advertising Age a few weeks ago about the thick economy, um, which briefly explained um, we used to be in a push economy where marketers made products and pushed them out into the, through the distribution channels into the stores. And then in about the 1950s or so with mass media, we had a, what we called a pull economy Pull marketing, where marketers, you know, through television and radio and all forms of advertising, tried to pull consumers into the stores looking for their specific brand. And today, consumers are picking everything. Yeah, you know, they pick uh, who they want the stars to be on American Idol. They can pick their own VW colors and all the uh, accoutrements that go into their BMW or Mini Cooper and so forth. And you raised an interesting question, and that is, you know, how can we apply those same principles to the airline, uh, airline industry? And um, I think one of the things, you know, especially in the service business is, you know, perhaps pick smiles. Pick smiles? <laughs> because so many, pick smiles, yeah. <laughs> because so many um, flight attendants and others on the airplane uh, in re surrounding your journey um, don't smile, don't say thank you, and thank yous are free. You know, right. they don't cost anything. As a matter of fact, we just did a study with one of our clients and uh, in terms of uh, traveling, frequent travelers, and uh, one of the biggest things that frequent travelers are looking for these days is acknowledgement. You know, acknowledge the fact that I spend a lot of time at your on your airline or at your hotel or in your facility and so forth, and all you have to do is say thank you. Right. And Granted, a lot of uh, flight attendants and, and personnel do say thank you as you're walking off the plane, but by that time it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> They've already been rude all the way through the process so, right. and charge you for luggage and all that. So it's a little um, uh, it's not very uh, right. authentic, authentic right. as we say these days. Right, so, right. That's one thing. Another thing might be to pick surprise. I mean, a lot of uh, marketers today are trying to come up with new and inventive, you know, whether it's uh, things to offer to their consumers, whether those things are new designs or new platforms. And, you know, just to be very simple about it, you know, uh, when everyone is expect getting on that plane is expecting to have a, well, less than appreciated experience, it might be a great surprise to uh, not only smile, but when people are expecting no food to, you know, be handed an apple or something. Right. And, you know, just something very simple like that. And uh, um, for every, you know, when no one else is offering you anything, no other airline, just a simple thing like offering an apple or something might be at least a token. Right. Um, and... Um, I just think that there are some airlines out there still, though, that are doing some interesting things, even mm -hmm. in the uh, face of all of this. Like, uh, but they tend to be smaller right. airlines. Uh, ones like I think it's Transair that's based in Atlanta mm -hmm. is a pretty uh, interesting airline. And uh, in Minneapolis, there's, a, there's one called Sun Country, which is in bankruptcy now for other issues. But it's a great little airline. They, have, they fly new planes. They have leather seats, which I think Transair does too. And the staff is all young and friendly and uh, makes you feel appreciated. Right. Uh, Vir Virgin, of course, is always, um, you know, stepping outside the, the zone in order to do something that's new and fresh and, and exciting. Right. Now, something interesting you mentioned was that Sun Country is doing all of these pleasing things very well, but then they are going out of business. Now, given the economic situation, do you think uh, it is more important to sustain operations or is it better to maintain brand equity? Well, I think it's always important to maintain brand equity. And by the way, Sun Country isn't going out of business because of the way they fly their airline. They have some their umbrella companies having some some issues okay. with the SEC. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
but uh, but I think that it's always, and there are lots of studies that bear this out, it's always better to be investing in your brand, during, especially during downturns like this, because no one else is. Right. And the, so when you come out at the end of it, uh, you were just that much farther ahead. I was at a conference in Las Vegas um, called um, um, Brand Manage Brand Camp, mm-hmm. and Brand Manage Camp. Las Vegas, and one of the speakers there uh, pointed out to us that um, in downturns like this and recessions, some uh, very upscale brands have been started. Uh, I think it was the recession of 1981. Um, and I, excuse me, I don't really know if there wasn't a recession in 1981, but it was back mm-hmm. in the point in time. Uh, sharper Image came on the scene. You know, and the notion, and during another recession, uh, Starbucks came up. Mm-hmm. And so the notion of, you know, having a store, a retail operation that sells boy toys, you know, expensive boy toys during, you know, this month would be extraordinary, I would say. Mm-hmm. And coming up with a notion of paying $3 for a cup of coffee when you can get for 50 cents, you know, during these times like this, like we're experiencing now, uh, Again, would be lunacy. Right. right. A lot of people, and and yet they did, and they have survived and um, done very well for themselves. So I think brand equity is something that's valuable to you in good times and bad. And by the way, having great brand equity will help you swing through bad times. Right. Right. Now, do you think that strong brands and strong branding can soften the impact of downturns on airlines? Can soften the impact. Yep. I think that very. I mean, there. I think that in the airline industry, so many of the of the brands, uh, the great brands, uh, have very little brand equity left. <laughs> They've kind of exhausted the brand bank. And some expe- some exceptions to that uh, might be Southwest, might be United. Um, might be American. I'm not sure. I've been flown American for a little while. But mm-hmm. uh, by the way, I have. I'm a platinum card holder, uh, and I've flown uh, 11 out of the last 16 weeks. So <laughs> I travel. For, I travel a lot, and um, so I think that the um, right. most of the airlines have exhausted their brand bank in terms of service. In terms of, uh, and what I mean by service is. Um, uh, being friendly and approachable and appreciative, I guess. Right, right. More than anything. Right. Everything else seems to be a commodity. We can uh, we can all go online and get our seats and so forth. So. Okay, interesting. Right. Now, one of the interesting trends that is emerging in the airline industry is the consolidated business model. So you have Delta plus Northwest, you have Air France plus KLM, and all of these conglomerate airlines. How do you think airlines can leverage on a merger or a consolidation to enhance brand equity? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I think that one of the first things to do is make it one airline rather than two. And I, I think that uh, in the case of Delta and Northwest, they'll probably do that over time. Right. But I think the other thing is that the strongest culture needs to survive. I think the most, in this case, it should be the, also be the, they should consider the most positive culture. Mm-hmm. And it's very difficult when uh, mergers happen like this because you have basically two colliding belief systems. Right. Uh, unfortunately, in the case of Delta and Northwest, uh, here in Minneapolis, we call it Northwest, <laughs> the, um, uh, they're both a set of, uh, of crabby <laughs> uh, flight attendants. So yeah, I don't know who's going to be more positive coming out of that. But KLM was a great air. Uh, I always thought was a great airline right. in many respects. And uh, the um, uh, but what you have basically just to step back again, you know, to the whole branding question is that you have two colliding belief systems. And what you need to do there is sort out your current equities and and figure out a new brand story, a new brand narrative, and how you're going to tell that story. Um, is, is very important, not just to consumers, but also internally, because you know there you have a lot of union things and so forth. But basically, well, we all need a reason to come to work in the morning. Right. And uh, union issues and other things aside, uh, we all need to be fed some sense of hope. We need to be fed some sense of purpose and meaning. And 
flight attendants and people in the air, baggage handlers, pilots, and everyone else, mechanics, are no exception to that rule. Right. Right. Now, finally, if there was one tip you could give to airlines on branding, what would that be? Oh, I think I already said smile. Smile? Smile. Yeah, it costs nothing. Dave Novak of Yum Brands, the CEO of Yum Brands, just wrote a great book this year that um, I, I don't know what the title of it is. But he makes a big uh, Yum Brands, for those who don't know, is KFC and Long John Silver mm -hmm. and uh, Taco Bell and some others. And he makes a big deal about rewarding employees and how simple it is. Uh, he makes the point of talking about when he was uh, president of Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC, uh, he used to hand out a rubber chicken mm -hmm. to uh, employees uh, if they did well. And, you know, here's a case where you're managing people who, you know, are working, a lot of them are working for minimum wage or just a little bit more, and trying to keep people like that motivated and enthused and trying to keep them focused on a singular purpose in an organization like that that's as fast as uh, fast food is is a, is a tough thing to manage. Right. And I think that the airlines industry has so much uh, more advantage to that because we're dealing with professionals, after all. They train professionals at that. Mm -hmm. And the incentives that they uh, give those people. Uh, David uh, Novak talks in his book, for example, about one employee who has been with the company for years and years, 30 years or something like that, who's finally, finally given the rubber chicken award. And he was so appreciative of the head, get, finally getting this reward. This is a guy who was in the back rooms, you know, logistics. I mean, he probably got the drumsticks to the restaurants on time or something, you know. But after 30, word, 30 years of working there, he's never been acknowledged. Because what he was doing was kind of basic, but without him, uh, the place just wouldn't run as smoothly. Uh, he was actually buried with, with his rubber chicken award, wow. which I think is amazing and at, at many levels. And, and it just reminds, serves to remind us, I think, that, that we all need to be appreciated and uh, both uh, inside the companies, inside the airlines, as well as the passengers. And we all keep the thing running smoothly. Great. Uh, flying, we all keep it flying smoothly. Right, right. Great. Thanks a lot, Pat, for joining us today and sharing your insights on simplification.